Welcome, everybody. My name is Imran Nanlawala. I'm the Executive Director for Insight Chicago Hospital Foundation. Welcome to our first virtual podcast. And today we have an amazing guest, someone who I've been following for many years. I have uh, two of his books, which we'll share the links to, Amazing, Amazing Guides for Anyone Suffering from Back Pain. We have the one and only Dr. Stuart McGill, who is a distinguished professor at the University of Waterloo, where he was a professor for 30 years. He has a laboratory and an experimental research clinic where he's investigated issues related to the casual mechanisms of back pain. He discusses how to rehab back pain. Uh, he works with back pain individuals to enhance both injury resilience and performance. He's actually worked with governments, corporations, legal experts, medical groups, and elite athletes and teams from all around the world. He's produced over 245 peer-reviewed scientific journal papers, several textbooks, and many international awards, including the Order of Canada in 2020. He's mentored over 37 graduate students during his scientific journey. During his time, he's taught thousands of clinicians and practitioners in professional development and continuing education around the world. And he continues as the Chief Scientific Officer for BackFit Pro. So without further ado, before we bring on the man himself, we have a little trailer video that we've uh, designed for him as, as any superhero would need. So here we are. Dr. Stuart McGill, how are you? <laughs> wow. Uh, I'm fabulous. Thank you. How are yeah. you? I'm, I'm doing great. And, you know, we, we had to, I had to bust out the suit. We needed to, to craft that trailer because honestly, and, and I mean this from the bottom of my heart, uh, I don't have many heroes, but you're definitely one of them as someone who's suffered uh, back pain since his teenage years and has gone through the gambit of just different practitioners, different doctors, different healing modalities. Once I stumbled upon you and I don't even remember how I got introduced to you. The first thing I did is I bought uh, the gift of back pain. And from there, I met Dr. George and Dr. Skaggs, and then I got uh, the back mechanic. And that's all, as, as they say, that's all she wrote. So um, I'm glad to hear that we uh, we helped you. My pleasure. And then so let's go. Let's go straight into your story, Dr. Dr. McGill. I mean, often here we have the finished product. You know, we have Dr. McGill, who has the, the McGill method, who's got the big three, who's got these books, these publications. How did we arrive to the Dr. McGill today? What, 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 what's your origin story, as I say, in the superhero world? <laughs> I uh, did my PhD in, in spine biomechanics and then became a professor uh, at the University of Waterloo, only ever asking one question, mm. how does the spine work? And we would perform experiments and probe uh, spines, people, and uh, tried to understand how they worked. That took us to how they became injured and their various pathways to pain, and then how best to rehabilitate those various pathways to pain. And finally, as we uh, were asked to work with uh, elite athletes, try and understand what were the specific demands of the sport then measure those in the athlete. If they had them, fine. If they didn't, what was the most efficient, spine-friendly way to restore world-class athleticism? So I started as a scientist. And then various hospital groups, medical groups, would ask me to come in and give a lecture and describe these various things. And then they would say afterwards, we don't think like that. But would you come and see a patient with us that would may fit the specifics that you just described? And I said, well, no, I'm not a clinician. And they said, don't worry, we'll be there with you. Would you please come and tell us what you see? And that's how it started. And uh, throughout my 40 years as a professor, I had the privilege of working with some fantastic uh, clinicians uh, surgeons, therapists, uh, some chiropractors, uh, some sports medicine docs, and uh, we just traded ideas and skills, and I slowly morphed into this uh, clinician to the point today where I'm retired from the university, but I am still asked to see patients uh, two days a week, and I send my reports back to the uh, referring teams or physicians. And that's pretty much the story. 
<laughs> the stories of you working with uh, Brian Carroll, uh, you know, uh, elite level, Olympic level power lifter, working with, I think, athletes from the UFC, working with individuals from the Olympics who train for the Olympics. You also mentioned in one of your former interviews that crown princes from various countries, right? So now, now this method is something that is more universal. But in those early days, what type of pushback were you getting from the quote unquote traditional medical community? Well, uh, going back to my original story, uh, they asked me to come and give lectures <laughs> and then they asked would I see patients. And uh, to this day, there are some days I'll wake up to 200 emails wow. from different clinicians, uh, different groups, different individuals. Uh, would I uh, offer my opinion or an assessment uh, to assist? So uh, all I've tried to do is respond to their requests. I'm certainly not a marketer. I'm not out there right. trying to market uh, anything. So I, I don't really get pushback to say, I mean, I, I do raise a few eyebrows once mm. in a while with uh, an opinion that we have converged upon because of uh, an investigation and uh, Sometimes I will say something about a specific medical group in terms of whether it's uh, common practice or how we could improve uh, common practice to assist uh, people with very specific uh, pathways to pain. Uh, for example, you, you may have heard me say, I don't believe that nonspecific back pain exists. Right. And yet a lot of patients are given the diagnosis, well, you have nonspecific back pain. Well, could you imagine telling a person you've got nonspecific head pain? You know, we wouldn't tolerate that. What do you mean I have nonspecific head pain? No, you would investigate with further uh, testing or evaluation or whatever the case may be to converge on a precise understanding of the head pain, which would then guide an appropriate strategy to remove the cause and address what is needed to make the head pain uh, go away. Mm -hmm. And we do exactly the same with back pain. So for those clinicians who uh, write papers about nonspecific back pain or uh, give patients the diagnosis of nonspecific back pain, they, they will question me when I say it doesn't exist. So there might be an example, but uh, we work through it. And uh, I think I'm able to help everyone converge on an approach that the patient can go away with a solid plan on what to do. And I think in your introduction, uh, you experience that. You're obviously a, a well-trained medic yourself, and yet uh, you weren't given the precision you needed on understanding your pain. But once you got that, uh, it became very manageable and uh, it's life altering. So I, I'm actually not a, I'm not a medic. I have no, 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 I'm the, I work on the nonprofit side of the hospital. However, um, it's amazing, you know, because once when I was suffering from my back pain, um, we started at the age of 15 until the age of 25. I mean, I, I, for me, the biggest difference was I did not accept the answers I was getting. Um, and that kept this desire and this yearning to search, search and learn, search and learn, search and learn. And I think that was really what helped. And then for me, even as a young kid, I did not believe that these things were not specific or not specific. And I did not believe that these were not curable because the body grows, the body changes, the body adapts. So I knew that there had to be a way, a mechanism to alleviate some of the back pain. And that's, you know, you know, as I say, thank God, that's what led me in this direction. So, yes. So I'm going to go straight into the questions that I have from our uh, co-host who was not able to be here today, Dr. Erica. And one of her first questions for you, Dr. McGill, is in some of your lectures, you mentioned that the diagnosis of degenerative disc disease isn't really a disease. I found your explanation insightful and applicable to my patients in physical therapy. Could you please explain what you meant by that? Yes. A person who is told they have degenerative disc disease, first of all, is incredibly destructive to the person. We get them here and they say, oh, doc, I, I have a disease, meaning that it's degenerative and they've lost hope. I've got nothing to look forward to. I'm just degenerating with disease. And yet it's not even true. 
The term degenerative disc disease is most often given in a radiology report, a radiology who's, ra radiologist who's never seen the patient. They've only seen a static picture. And they will look at a feature, which is usually a disc that has lost height in their spine, and they say, oh, that's degenerative disc disease. Well, just wait a second. If they have five lumbar vertebra and five lumbar discs, and one of them is a little flatter, it's lost a bit of height. It doesn't have a disease, it's been injured. Mm -hmm. So when we then look and probe into that radiology, we will find out why it's lost a bit of height. Maybe it's had an end plate fracture, maybe there's a disc bulge or whatever. Then we know precisely the end plate fracture was caused by an overload of compression. Oh yeah, I was squatting heavy, I felt my spine pop, that was the beginning of my back troubles. Now we've isolated the cause, and now we have a pretty good idea of what to do, or they have a posterior lateral disc bulge on the right-hand side. We then probe that, and we find out ways to vacuum in the disc bulge, if it's possible, and uh, we get a read fairly quickly as to whether or not the symptoms are traveling in the, in the direction of resolving or uh, getting worse. So it's a, to summarize, it's a horrible thing to tell a person that they have a degenerative disease when they don't, and to give them a precise, accurate, true description and understanding of what's going on allows them now to devise and execute a solid plan to address that specific damage or pain sensitivity, whatever it is, and get them back to enjoying a robust life. So I know in your book, you were mentioning uh, the manual traction. I actually, in one of the interviews, manual traction, and then you use, uh, I think, a windshield wiper technique. Yes. <laughs> y yes. So, so, and you mentioned in that same interview that it's possible to get the bulge to, to I, I guess, rescind back into like the, the main part of the disc. Now, absolutely. We, we do before and after MRIs, measure the size of the disc bulge. And there are certain features that determine the ability of the disc bulge to resolve. If the person meets those features, quite often they're successful in reducing the size of the disc bulge without surgery, uh, et cetera. Such as, could you just could give us a quick uh, explanation of what are those features? Yes. Let me give a, a little bit of uh, every one of these models that you see behind me are a very specific uh, mechanism of pain. So let me, yes, this would be a, uh, a good example. Now, interestingly enough, the larger the disc bulge, usually the greater the ability for it to resolve, which is somewhat counterintuitive to a lot of clinicians and to a lot of patients. So the inside of the disc is a gel and the outside of the discs are rings of collagen fibers uh, that make up a fabric, actually. So my shirt mm -hmm. is a fabric, many fibers. Uh, and and uh, if I wanted to work a hole in my shirt, I would create stress strain reversals back and forth like this. The fibers would delaminate. Now, too much motion under too much load mm -hmm. allows the ground substance holding all the fibers together to get a bit soft. Now, if you want to be a dancer or uh, uh, do yoga, or th that's all fine. You're adapting a softness to the ground substance holding all these fibers together. But if you want to lift heavy or you do a heavy occupation, uh, better to back off on the mobility and you will add more load bearing ability to the disc. So here's an example where a delamination has now occurred. Do you see at the end of my finger, there's a yes. red mark on the back of that annulus. Now watch, I'm going to flex the spine forward, which causes the disc to go into a, a, uh, a parallel, uh, well, a, a an oblique parallelogram. So the hydraulic effort is pushed mm. posteriorly. So the nuclear gel now, I'm going to squeeze and flex. Do you see the yep. collagen fibers delaminating yes. and a little bit of a bulge? Now yes. I'm going to apply the antidote. I'm not going to allow the spine to flex and I'm going to squeeze the disc. You see the whole disc is flattening down. Mm. 
but there's nothing hydraulically being forced posteriorly yes. because I'm not directing it with a flexion bend. Now, that's not the only way to get a disc bulge, but your uh, question to me was how can you resolve it? So if that disc bulge, there it is, and it, it's, it's caused by bending and, and squeezing, if we could then put a traction load on the spine with a little bit of extension, and sometimes, but not in everybody, sometimes if I then take their feet and that's the windshield motion that I was talking about, only to get the pelvis to slightly roll back and forth. We discovered in cadaveric spines that you could vacuum in the bulge by reversing the positive pressure, making it a vacuum and slowly uh, sucking it in. Wow. Now, you, you could get a person to simply go for repeated walks throughout the day. And I suspect you found this as yes. well repeated walks in an upright posture, swinging the arms about the shoulders, combined with stabilization exercises to add a little bit more core control will allow a disc bulge uh, to reduce. Uh, now, that may or may not work for the next person. There will be another nuance that we will see uh, if, from the data we gather on the provocation uh, uh, tests that we do during the assessment, and we will learn um, whether the disc bulge will resolve, uh, what exactly is required to get it to resolve and not grow. Now, there's just an example of a posterior disc bulge. Uh, now, that's common with people who've created that through lifting. They might have lifted their their child repeatedly out of the crib in the morning. Uh, and then they sit all day at a desk job. In other words, they're comp comp <laughs> creating the perfect storm for that kind of delamination to occur. But the next person hasn't lifted anything. Mm. Um, they are a mobility kind of a person. When they bend forward, it's the front of the disc that buckles. So it's a different kind of bulging. Uh, the shape and size of the person's spine depends on uh, where the stress concentrations are. For example, you can imagine taking a thin willow branch, bending it back and forth. There's no stress in that willow branch. But if you take a thicker stick and bend it, it shatters right away because the resistance to bending is a function of the thickness of the tube. So a, a person with a very heavy boned skeleton uh, probably would be better off not to do exercises like sit-ups and touching their toes, whereas a more slender-spined person wouldn't get the same stress concentrations in that. So we, we recognize all of these individual variables and differences and uh, then prove in the assessment what is going to take them in the direction of resolution versus exacerbation or making it worse. So I, I hope that gives a little bit of a, an example, but I can get into the nuances of spine stability and all of these variables that help us to converge on what is best for the individual. No, it makes perfect sense. So let, let, again, I'm going to approach this as a layperson. So disc bulge occurs and then, you know, putting the appropriate load or evenly distributing the load because you gave that example of how the disc bulges uh, and when it does not bulge. So then we give some, some proper traction with the right mechanisms and it's possible to get that bulge back in. Now my question is, uh, in terms of the outer part of that disc, and I think the term you used was delamination. Now, once that integrity of that outer part of the disc is compromised, is it compromised forever? Or once people start using the techniques that you describe in your book, you know, that which we'll get into later, the core stiffening versus bracing, et cetera. Does that give the body now appropriate time to either gristle up or form the right amount of pressure around that around that vertebrae? So how, how does that work? Yeah, if I can just go back and, sure. and you used the example of traction. That was yes. only one little example. Okay. That tr traction might actually hurt right. the next person. So I, I, I'm not promoting traction as right. a cure for back pain. It was just for that specific example. That, that this has to be made very clear. It's, it's a very individual thing, just like with leg pain. <laughs> we have to know what causes the leg pain right. so we know exactly how to, uh, to, uh, to approach it. 
So the gristling, uh, it, again, it depends. Um, if the disc, and here's a general rule of thumb, if the disc still has 70% of its original height or more, right. uh, it, it, it can resolve the disc bulge. Now, it depends on the nature of, of the disc bulge. When you first get a disc bulge, uh, the gel is a viscous gel. But the first time it sees the immune system of the body when it leaks through the delamination, the immune system has never seen the uh, nucleus of the disc before. It was fused up when you or I w were a fetus. Right. So it, it's an avascular material that, that's never seen the immune system. When it sees the immune system, the immune system does one or one of two things. It sets off in a massive inflammatory response because this is a foreign body and the macrophages and whatnot will digest what has been extruded. That may happen. And, and some of the scientific literature, not our own, but from others recently has shown going on anti-inflammatories actually delays the recovery of that particular type of a uh, disc bulge mm -hmm. and it makes sense you want the inflammation to digest the extruded material um however uh sometimes uh the opposite will uh will, will happen as well but uh over time you you may not need traction just simply going for short walks throughout the day and avoiding the length of time you spend sitting might be for, for the next person allowing the disc bulge to resolve and then don't stretch don't touch your toes for this particular individual just uh, instead of tying your shoe uh, bending down stressing the disc that has been softened through injury tying your shoe instead we'll we offer techniques of what we call spine hygiene putting your foot up on the chair taking your hips down to the target and now you see I haven't stressed the disc bulge and I tie my shoe this way. And this is, by the way, how we get athletes to withstand the rigors of the game and get back to the sport through movement hacks from spine hygiene, creating pain-free capacity so that they can get back to training. Are they cured? No. But they very successfully manage the symptoms down to subclinical. They don't matter anymore and if they behave a certain way they create robustness for training and over time that immune system forms the extruded nucleus into a plug it's like crab meat so what mm. comes out as a gel then goes to crab meat and it gristles in there and and uh, anyway the, the, right. there's a it, it just goes on and on and on the variance in all of these processes but when you are sensitive to what matters and what's causing pain in the individual, figuring it all out, you can give them a customized strategy to, to create the gristling. And uh, in someone your age, it's probably going to take 10 years for that gristling to take place. But you have learned the ways to successfully manage it in the meantime, as you have. Someone my age... My spine is getting gristly and stiff. The bad news is I'm losing a bit of mobility. The mm. good news is 70-year-olds don't complain about discogenic <laughs> herniated discs. They're at that stage in their life where that mechanism is now gone. We deal with other things like arthritis and stenosis. <laughs> so things things change uh, as, as you... Uh, uh, sweeten up with age. <laughs> I was I was reading, you know, I've read that for so many years, and I'm like, I'm looking forward to that day, right? Where, as you get older, the discogenic symptoms are really no longer there. But of course, you lose some mobility. But that, that's to right. be expected. Yeah, I well, mean, care, careful what you ask for, because some <laughs> of the other things aren't so much fun. <laughs> that's a, that, that's a, that, that's an excellent point. You were mentioning yeah. uh, with, with Bob and Brad that you know you you have less pain now than you did in your 30s, and. Oh, yeah. um, I, you, you know, you brought up athletes earlier, and I want to just quickly touch upon B Brian Carroll's story. And and the reason I want to do that is because I want to give hope to those who are without hope, right? And I, obviously someone who suffered for 10 years, uh, and I'm going to give you just a quick nutshell, right? It was 
ultrasound, x-ray, CAT scan, MRI, eventually kidney biopsy. It was all these strange, <laughs> strange things that were happening because they couldn't, the, the doctors that I were seeing could not understand the symptoms. So for those who are without hope and for those who feel because their MRI shows X, Y, Z, right? Um, and their doctor has told them that surgery is the next best thing or these type of injections are the next best thing. With Brian, I believe it was multiple levels of disc herniation at the lumbar level. I believe it was a fractured sacrum. And we're not talking about somebody who just went back to now after working with you, who's just walking down the street and, you know, picking up his kid and enjoying life. No, he's still deadlifting or squatting over 800 pounds. So can you give us, without maybe mentioning names, what are some of the more extreme cases that you've seen? Something that's permitted for you to say. Um, and what prog like what what healing have they been able to achieve and only for the purpose of giving people hope? Well, Brian Carroll, since you mentioned, has now set the world record of all time heaviest squat, 1,306 wow. pounds. If you can wrap your head around putting half a car on your back and squatting it. And uh, we wrote a book together on his story called Gift of Injury to Give People Hope. He had a horrific back injury. Uh, I can show the uh, mechanism. As I said, each one of these models has been crafted to uh, describe the uh, uh, variety of injuries. He had a fracture in his spine. Now, it was down in the sacrum, but I'm just showing it. Sure. Uh, with uh, this particular model into the vertebra. So as you pressurize this disc, the end plate, which is the top of the vertebra, fractured and split. If you can look down the hole, we've dyed the nucleus blue. So as he squeezed, you can see the nucleus coming up into the vertebral body. And uh, Usually, if a surgeon sees that in an emergency, on occasion, they will do what's called a vertebroplasty. They mm. inject bone cement into the vertebra to try and uh, stabilize it. Well, anyway, Brian had gone to a couple of surgeons, and the story starts where he's out of the hospital now. The surgeons didn't really have too much to offer him. He is a world record holding power lifter, and now he's so disabled he can hardly walk. And he's sitting there with a gun in his lap, actually mm -hmm. wondering if uh, life is worth continuing. Somehow, I don't. Uh, he got my name, and uh, I, I saw him at the university. And uh, for the next year, he followed the program in back mechanic short little interval walks, swinging the arms about the shoulders in an upright posture. He was very clever at adopting the techniques of spine hygiene. He created proximal stability through doing uh, the bird dog, the side bridge and the curl up. And then he added suitcase carries to the program. And he did this for a year, allowing these tissues to heal. And then he changed now. He's out of pain. He's established a pain-free foundation for bearing a little bit of load. And then the adaptation changed to create athleticism. So some people uh, in doing squats or deadlifts or something, they do them way too often every other day. Some do them every day, not realizing that you exercise to stimulate adaptation. It's called mechanostimulation. The language of cells to adapt in our body is force and pressure. But you have to allow time for the adaptations to occur. So it's actually under training. Mm. <laughs> that is the, the secret here. So he would do very mild loading of the bone and then wait five days. We call this bone callusing to slowly rebuild the it's actually based on a piezoelectric principle. So when you bend a bone, it's piezoelectric. It develops a charge, an electric charge, a microcharge, where the highest stress is. Those uh, electrical charges attract the free ions floating in the plasma in the blood of calcium and magnesium, the basic building blocks of bone. They chemically bond electrically to where the site of stress is. 
But if you go and train the next day, you break off the bond. It's not very strong yet. It takes five days on average to create a more robust bond. So now it's held. You've built a callus over the fracture, just mm. like you would in a broken arm or, or anything else. So instead of immobilizing the arm for three months in a cast, we mechanostimulate and then control the motion through, through spine hygiene. So that was his particular program to slowly getting back and being clever enough and patient enough and professional enough to get back to setting the all time uh, squat record. We've done this with, uh, I can't think of an Olympic sport where we haven't had a, an athlete from that sport uh, as a patient. And we had to document the demands of the sport and then rebuild their body to have the capability to withstand those demands, tune their body and uh, bring it back. Every professional sport, uh, baseball, basketball, hockey, football, uh, the combat sports yes. of uh, mixed martial arts, uh, uh, the, the submission championships. You know, Imran, if you could give me two minutes to tell Please. a story. I, yes, I we, we, we can restore athletic careers, but don't let me give the impression that we have success with everybody. Of course we don't. But we do have a lot of success stories of people who were told they have zero hope, their career is over. Mm -hmm. But what is more satisfying to me is when we can change a person's life who is your mother or your daughter. Mm -hmm. That's far more important. I'm going to give an example. Sure. I was asked, on occasion I'm asked to, uh, by say a medical group or a hospital, would you come to our hospital and we'd like you to, we'd like to see you assess three patients on our stage in our uh, auditorium, uh, grand rounds perhaps, and we want to see how you think and assess that person. I was at a hospital and they brought out this uh, woman. She'd be about 70 years of age and she walked onto the stage and I said to her, okay, well, can you tell me your story? Well, she never mentioned her back pain. She was very psychologically distressed and she said, when I sit on the toilet and I get off the toilet, my therapist is afraid I'm going to fall onto the floor mm. and I'm going to have to leave my home. And at that point, she broke down and started to cry. This woman was having to leave her home because a the therapist told her this. Mm. And I said, oh, could someone bring a stool out onto the stage, please? And they did. And I said to this woman, there's a toilet. I'm just going to turn my sure, sure. camera down just a little bit. There's a toilet. And could you sit on the toilet for us? And she had her knees together and very incompetently just kind of plopped onto the toilet. And I said, could you get up for me? And she struggled to get up. And then she was just basically collapsing onto the floor. And I said, okay. I helped her to stand up. And I said, we're going to play a little bit of baseball. Make your hands like this with a V between your thumb and your fingers. We're going to place your kneecaps there. And now I'm going to change the shape of your back so it's comfortable. And then she was falling back on her heels. And I said, oh, well, you're a leaning tower. Push your toes down and lean forward. Good. Now, don't stand up by pulling and lifting with your back. Pull your hips through and slide your hands up. And then I had to coach her just a little bit to lean forward as a leaning tower, carry more weight down her arms, which established more proximal core stability. And then now you can start to see how we established a very competent ability to squat. Hmm. And then I said, okay, use exactly the same technique and sit on the toilet. Hmm. And then she brought her knees together. And I showed her that it's not possible for her to get off the toilet with her knees together. But when we spread her knees, pull her feet back underneath her. Now, suck a little bit of air. Lean forward through your hips. Put your hands on your knees. Now pull your hips through. And I, at that point, Imran, I didn't say another word. And she did it again. And she did it again. And she started to smile. And I said, what's up with you? And she said... I don't have to leave my home, do I? Wow. And I said, no, you don't.
do you know that some of those very mature clinicians in that audience had tears in their eyes? They had never seen the power of athletics before to change a person's life. And all I did was teach her the foundational principles of weightlifting 101. Spread your knees apart, get them underneath you, get some established stiffness and pull your hips through. It was all in her. But every one of them had failed to recognize the technique, the skill of movement, and then the coaching tools to create it, to change a person's life instantaneously. And that was massive. So when you ask me to name some of the celebrity names and show off with that, I get far more satisfaction out of telling you the story of how we could change, or not, not, not we, I, I don't mean it that way, but these scientific principles to establish what the mechanism is that's inhibiting this person and causing their pain and their disability and to address it precisely. She didn't have degenerative disc disease or anything else. So Amazing. If, that's your, if that's your mother, yes, th that is the most satisfying story I can tell you. Um, I'm actually, so I'm going to be visiting Dr. George again in a, in a couple of weeks. Um, and I'm, I'm trying to convince my father to come with me uh, because, you know, this is a good segue into the next question that Erica had written out. But I think the issue, and I don't want to be too critical, is in the American culture or in the American you know, system, we're not given enough time with our healers, with our practitioners, right? And a lot of this is not just therapy, it's education. And that, I think that's what I really appreciate about your approach and your master clinicians and your clinicians is you're supposed to get in there. The first appointment is about three to four hours. And it's if you've never experienced anything like this, it's surreal, right? It's literally, uh, when I went to see Dr. George, you strip down to your undergarments, they're taking pictures of how you flex, how you extend, how you balance, how you do this, grip strength, this strength. Um, they get you on the table, they have you do different movements. And it is so enlightening because there's so many things that someone who has years and decades of experience uh, doing this can pick up on. Oh, you see, you know, you're, you're compensating here or like Dr. Uh, Dr. George noticed something um, you know, so I've always, I've always had left-sided issues, uh, that stem, stem back from a trip that I took to India when I was 15, I got parasites and for, for years I had left-sided issue, left-sided back pain, left-sided stomach pain. And, um, 10 years later, after I healed, I eventually had kidney stones left-sided. So when I'm with Dr. George, he says, it's interesting. Your, your left quadricep has atrophied a little bit, something I, I never noticed. None of my doctors noticed. So Erica's question was regarding your three-hour evaluation. And I already know the answer to this, but I'm going to have to ask. So for patients who are limited by insurance coverage and have time constraints in physical therapy clinics or the doctors and clinicians who have uh, time constraints, what are some things patients can ask their doctor to help them look closer into the mechanics of their pain? I have a twofold answer, Imran. Sure. The first one is this will sound self-serving but i wrote back mechanic for a reason it takes the reader through a self-assessment of their pain showing them precisely what the cause of their pain is and then it offers the movement hacks around the pain to allow it to desensitize shows them how to tune their body and then build a base of movements that don't trigger pain that's why I wrote that book, because of the impediments, the systemic impediments of the American medical system, where a back pain patient cannot go and find someone who can give them a thorough assessment and take their nonspecific back pain to something that's very specific and therefore manageable. So I wrote the book. My other answer is the insurance companies we have something that I don't understand. The insurance companies are business corporations. I don't understand why they don't audit, why they keep spending money on things that cost them money. We've done experiments where I have educated 
groups of physical therapists who bill an HMO. After they've gone through just a three-day training program with us, they are seeing back pain patients for half the number of visits than they wow. saw before, saving the insurance company a lot of money. Now, wouldn't you think the insurance company would insist on them getting that expertise and helping people to self-manage their pain with education, movement skills, et cetera. The other thing is there's no expert in the American medical system who is trained to assess back pain hmm. because you need expertise in movement, anatomy, physiology, biomechanics, the science of pain, psychology, learning how to coach, et cetera, et cetera. I have to train those people. So that's why we have the online clinical courses. It's 60 hours just to get through my first section of me giving lectures. And then we converge on a location for the hands-on skills training. But there's no billing code that exists in the medical system. So the clinician can say, oh, I'm going to do an assessment of your back pain. So we know with some specificity and precision what the cause is. I can't bill for that. It doesn't mm -hmm. exist. So here's the next challenge to the insurance industry. You must create billing codes to pay people to do a thorough assessment, and they will save a lot of money in targeting now what the most appropriate approach is for that particular uh, individual. And, and we can prove um, the cost savings that yes. we've done with several uh, companies and uh, organizations. So one, my answer is it's sort of an administrative right. uh, medical system type of answer. But the other is what can the individual do to uh, get going? So you are obviously a highly educated, motivated person. Somehow you found the book Back Mechanic. But uh, what a doc can do, and we, there's a lot of family physicians who refer their back pain patients to back mechanic. So they'll say, uh, uh, yes, here's the best thing I can offer you, uh, read back mechanic. And there's, there's sections and there's a whole section on, well, should you have surgery? And we go into the risks involved. There are certain spine surgeries that have a very high risk. There are some that are low risk. Uh, and, and a higher chance of, of a good reward. So these are all of the things that people need to make decisions on, but they have to be informed so that they make the best decision. But, you know, Imran, of all, and, and here, here was another thing. When I started the experimental research clinic at the university, we said we would follow up with every single patient we ever saw to know our score. Are we making a difference? And I don't know of another clinic that has ever done mm. that. How do they know that what they do is effective? And I can tell you this, if you came to the clinic and you tried physio, osteopathy, chiropractic, you've been to the shrink, you've had a surgical consult, you've done all of these interventions and, and you were told now everything has failed. The last thing for you is surgery. If that's the category that you were in when you came to the clinic and you followed the principles of back mechanic, which is virtual surgery. Yes. So tomorrow you're not going to the gym and doing the elliptical trainer to relieve your stress. You're going to behave like a post-surgical patient and you're slowly going to rebuild yourself in progressive exposures to challenges, but you have to meet them successfully recover from surgery, but you didn't have the surgery, virtual surgery. Do you know that 95% of the people who followed that program, they were told to have surgery, but they didn't. Incredible. After In a two-year follow-up, 95% said they were glad that they didn't have the surgery and they're satisfied with their current status. Wow. So there's a statistic that I can, I've measured and I can stand behind. So th that's my answer to what can the person do sure. uh, if they cannot find. Now, I've also spent a lot of time 
training clinicians in the assessment and they bill for time. They, they don't bill a billing code. That right. They don't exist. So as you see, Dr. George, he, he charges you for time. Now, not everybody can afford that time. I get it. Hopefully they can afford a book. Uh, yeah, I, I would I like to give a, a testimonial for, for the for the mechanisms and for the methodology here. I mean, I would say that, you know, we spend money on so many things. We have so many uh, subscriptions for TV watching. We have uh, many monthly plans and we, you know, eat out and drink coffees. I would say the book is it's written really it's it's detailed enough, but it's also not overly complicated. So other than learning some loose and anatomical terms like facet joints and learning about, you know, the different uh, areas of the spine and some primary nerves. It's, it's a, it's a pretty simple read and everything is laid out there. All the exercises, all the cues. If this extra, if this exercise causes you pain, move to this, try repositioning like this. So I would, I highly recommend individuals to get the book. Um, I would also say your website, BackFit Pro, has uh, a plethora of other resources, as you mentioned, the courses, uh, and then also on YouTube. You know, there are there are mo a multitude of videos on YouTube of yourself, Brian, and others actually going over the the McGill Big Three, the exercises that you recommend people to do. So I, I highly recommend people get the book and go to YouTube and visit your site. Now, for people who can spend a little bit more, and it's not in, in the grand scheme of things, it's not much at all. I highly recommend seeing a master clinician, a McGill master clinician, or even a regular clinician, and people can find those on your website. Uh, they're not everywhere. You're not going to find one in every state, uh, even though the list is growing. Uh, but the detail of care that you'll get is unlike anything that you've ever experienced. And again, I hate to bring up the same points, but Dr. George and his team, amazing people, heartfelt wel welcome. And when you're there, you really feel this sense of care trust, integrity, and uh, no amount of money can buy that. Honestly, no amount of money can pay for such a service and such a gift. So I would, I, I highly recommend those steps uh, to, to the individuals that are listening. Well, I appreciate that. Yeah, Dr. James George, he's at the Central Institute for Human Performance in St. Louis, Missouri. A fabulous uh, clinic, but as you experience, it's so much more than a clinic. They have top athletes coming in. They'll get an assessment. They'll go into uh, therapists and whatnot that specialize in reducing pain. And then you go right around the corner and there's a big training center to uh, throw some weights around, drag sleds, and, and really restore some athleticism as well. But um, uh, the director, Clayton Skaggs, and uh, uh, the docs like Dr. Jim George are just fabulous people. And uh, the uh, efficacy is, uh, well, it, it speaks for itself. Uh, so, um, Dr. McGill, are you, how, how, many, how much more time do you think you have? And feel very comfortable. I can edit this part out so it's, it's no issue of me asking you this question. Well, you, you can, we can go a little bit longer. Sure. That's okay. Uh, maybe a couple more questions. Um, sure. <laughs> so, so, so I know you mentioned, uh, and I, I, you know, I, of course, because I've read the book, I, I feel like I have a good understanding of this. Uh, but Erica was asking about you referencing core stiffness and in the physical therapy world, sometimes there's a good stiffness and a bad stiffness. And I know you bring, you, you mentioned bracing stiffness and fine tuning that. So what do you mean? All right. What do we mean by core fitness or core stability? I'm going to show you with some models here and uh, with myself. We live in an articulated linkage. Our skeleton is an articulated uh, linkage. Now, let's say I do a bench press exercise and I can bench press uh, 200 kilo or 440 pounds. I can't, but, but let's just say I was very strong and I could. I would develop my pec major muscle. The pec major crosses the front of my shoulder joint. So the muscle, when it contracts distally to the shoulder joint, it creates the athleticism, it creates the push. But the muscle proximal to the shoulder joint connects on my rib cage. So when it contracts, it collapses my rib cage. So if all of I use, if all I use is my bench press muscle to create a push, all I do is collapse. It doesn't create the desired athletic effect. So if I lock down 
my proximal body, 100% of that pec major contraction is now expressed distally and I've got the punch. So if I'm boxing on the offensive line of, of, of the NFL, I have to have a lot of core stability to allow me to have distal athleticism. If I'm running, I have to have core stability to lock my core. So when I extend my hip with hip extensor athleticism, my spine doesn't bend and create an energy leak. So if I carry a suitcase, I had to do that with core stability. Otherwise, my spine would collapse with each uh, step, which it does in very low functioning people. So proximal stability is non-negotiable mm. in an articulated linkage. So that's rule number one. And it's a rule with um, uh, the articulated linkage. The next feature is the spine is a flexible rod. Well, having a flexible rod and a spine is beautiful. It allows me to bend and tie my shoe and it it allows me to dance and to, I hate to say this, to have sex and have fun and procreate. <laughs> sure. So a flexible spine is a wonderful thing. But if I want to pick my child out of the crib at two o'clock in the morning with a flexible spine, it will collapse. Mm. Your spine, if we were to take it out of you in a cadaver or a, a post-mortem, for example, it only supports five pounds and then it buckles. So here's a model of a flexible rod, your spine, that has stiffness to it. This spine is able to bear load because it has stiffness and you create stiffness by, the, the body naturally does it, but in some people they don't have sufficient stiffness to pick their child out of the crib. So if I could say, push, push your fingers laterally into your oblique muscles. Now contract your abdominal wall and push your fingers out. Just, sufficient, not too much and not too little. So you tune the brace or the stiffening and that allows your spine to bear load. You pick your child up, you pull your hips through and now you've done it in a very confident way, not creating stress concentrations that will lead to a back injury. But now I'm going to take the stiffness out by reducing the compressive wire and you see the spine wow. buckles and collapses very quickly. Hmm. So that is why core bracing is non-negotiable in athletes and in people walking around in life. Now, injury, when it occurs, causes a loss of stiffness. So we could take a knee joint, for example, and people are very familiar with this. These are the ACL uh, uh, collateral, anterior and posterior collateral ligaments. If they get torn, the knee doesn't glide anymore. There is an element of shear instability. Mm. Do you see the shearing going back and forth? Yes. So you know the clinical tests. The doctor gets your 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 lower leg and he pushes it back and or she pushes it back and forth to measure the instability and then to see if that triggers pain. Injury damage causes a loss of joint stiffness and now you get micro movements. So the spine equivalent is shown in this particular model. And these are brilliant models. All of these are made by a company called Dynamic Disc Designs yes. that, that took the injuries that we documented in the clinic and lab. So this disc is normal. This disc is normal, but this one has had a little bit of damage to it. So it's lost stiffness. Now I'm going to apply a general torque and movement. Do you see yes. how the majority of the micro movement is occurring at the joint that's lost stiffness? Mm. Now, the character of that pain is sometimes you'll lay on one side in bed and your left toe will go to sleep. Then you move another way and the pain goes into your right glute yep. or your left low back. So the pain migrates around, which is very characteristic pain associated with these joint micro movements. Well, if I could get out of the chair with just a little gentle controlling brace. I can walk, I can do a knee circle with a gentle controlling brace. I've eliminated that micro movement and eliminated the pain. Obviously, if I'm going to pick up a heavy load, you know, they'll pick up the bar, they stiffen into it, they bend the bar, they create tremendous stiffness and pull through with their hips. So they know how to do this. 
But some people who suffer from these micro movements who haven't been coached on what the cause of their pain is and therefore what the cure is, uh, they will remain getting these stabs of pain in their back. And, and this is the critical element, Imran. Can you imagine walking around never knowing when a bogeyman is out there who's going to slam a knife in your back? It gives people PTSD, the unknown. But when we educate them to show with precision, they don't have non-specific pain. It's very specific. <laughs> and then when we show them the specificity of their pain, say, for example, they say, oh, the last time I sneezed, I threw my back out. Right. Well, it was because they sneezed downwards and they have what we call a dynamic disc bulge. But if we showed them that is the mechanism of your pain and you would bulletproof your back if you suck up some air, it's a little bit of a change, but you can learn this, sneeze upwards. You've now made it impossible for the knife to come into your back. The next time they bend down and tie their shoe and they get a little bit of a pain trigger, instead of that being the bogeyman giving them post-traumatic stress disorder, that pain now became their tutor. Ah, oh, I didn't use my movement hack. I'm now going to repeat that tying of the shoe in a way that doesn't trigger pain. So do you see you've transformed the unknown, the psychological bogeyman into your friendly tutor? It's, a, it's an enormous psychological empowerment that goes on with this approach. It's a dream, and I really mean this. It's a dream. I, I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to sign up for your courses online, even though they're meant for active practitioners. Uh, just for the knowledge, I have four young kids and I, I've, I've taught my kids the big three, you know, and I want them to continue utilizing these movements and learning these patterns. Uh, but at any time in the future, you, if you need someone uh, to do your laundry, you need a driver, you need someone to pick up your groceries, you need a personal assistant or secretary. I, I, I wholeheartedly volunteer my time. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> well, I can tell you one thing. As a yeah. hospital administrator, uh, we have uh, organizations, be they a sports group, uh, a, uh, a state or a provincial group or a group of physical therapists or whatever. As a group, they take the courses and we offer a discount for uh, groups as well. So maybe the uh, folks at your hospital can better serve uh, your clientele in Chicago. If I go to the website, can I find the group discount on there or should I email? No, no, you'll have to email. There's Sarah. an email beside that. Sarah is okay. the uh, CEO of BackFit Pro. Perfect. And uh, she will uh, look after all of that. Honestly, uh, Dr. McGill, and I, I'm, I'm telling you this, I don't have many people that I look up to. I don't have many people that I really, really respect. You know, you're my teacher. Uh, you're someone that I, I wish and I pray that you have a long life and I hope you have a long life of doing what you've been doing, which is teaching, educating, being sincere, uh, working with the individuals and giving them hope because you've given me hope. You've given countless others hope. So I wish nothing but prosperity, good health and, and, and good fortune to you and yours. And I really hope that Backfit Pro can uh, expand tenfold and you guys can add more team members and you can produce more courses, more, more articles and, I thank you from the bottom of my heart to, to you know, making yourself av available to this. And one day I pray and I hope to see you in person. And that is a sincere hope that I have. Thank you very much for all of that, Imran. And uh, the best of luck to you, your family, and all that you do.